So one of the biggest problems in social sciences, medical sciences, is we often have questions we would like to answer, questions that are causal questions, um, but it's not possible to do an experiment. So a good example might be within the social sciences that uh, we would like to know what is the effect of going to college on people's earnings. Well, what would be ideal is to do an experiment where you know, we have 100 people that we send to college, uh, and I have 100 people who uh, uh, we tell them they can't go to college, and uh, to then do, you know, see what happens to the, the randomly assigned people. But of course, this would be uh, unethical, and uh, probably the people wouldn't cooperate. Uh, some of the ones who we sent to college would drop out, and some of those we told who couldn't go uh, would decide that they, they were going to go anyways. So we can look and see, uh, have data on what, what the incomes of are of people who have gone to college uh, versus people who haven't. Uh, but this is not experimental data. It's what we often call observational data. And so the question is, you know, perhaps we see that uh, people who go to college make 30% more. Why do they make 30% more? Well, one possibility, of course, is by going to college, they acquired a lot of skills, uh, learning, certification, and as a result, they're eligible for bench better paying jobs. But of course, uh, it also might be the case that the people who go to college are just plain smarter than the people who don't. And our problem without ex doing an experiment is, how do we figure out uh, whether those who go to college are there because uh, make more money because of the effects of going to college, or is it really uh, just an effect of what we call selection bias, i.e. who it is that chose to go to college? So there, there are uh, many, many problems like of this type, both in the social and science, it's in the medical sciences. You can easily imagine a case where you've discovered a, a, a new and supposedly very powerful effective drug. Uh, again, you would, might like to do a randomized experiment, uh, but you know it could be considered unethical or maybe not even feasible to randomly assign people. So what's happened in really since uh, the early 80s is the social and medical sciences have gone through uh, a revolution in terms of thinking about how to analyze non-experimental data. The approach, uh, in part, is to take experimental thinking uh, and try to extend it to contexts where uh, experiments aren't possible. What's been important about this is, is that uh, for many decades um, in both areas, uh, causal analysis has been done in sort of a very um, informal way. Sometimes it's just enough that there is an association. Uh, so we, you know, we see that people who go to school more uh, make more money, so we claim uh, that must be with the effects of going to school. Um, but even more sophisticated things, where you know, maybe we look at people who, uh, among people whose parents or siblings went to college, and we ask, well, if you went to college did, you know, with an anchor group versus you didn't, did you make more money? At the core uh, of this revolution is the notion of a potential outcome. This is an idea that Don Rubin here at Harvard uh, did the early work and, and developed. And the notion is actually quite a simple one, which is that we would like to know what the outcome would have been for you, a particular individual, if you had, say, gone to college, what would your income be, uh, versus what would happen to somebody, if you, this particular individual, if they hadn't go to college, what would their income be? And then we would think for that individual, uh, what would be the difference uh, in terms of what happened to their incomes, whether they went to college or not. So this seems like a very, very simple idea. But I think it's a very nice example of how in science sometimes simple, well-defined ideas can have an enormous amount of leverage. So 
there have been you know, dozens of people who've uh, worked on this area. A number of Nobel Prizes in economics have been offered to people who work on it, people like James Heckman at the University of Chicago. And what's key with this counterfactual notion is the idea that we now have a precise definition of what the causal effect means. Now, of course, it's not magic. We, in fact, we've now discovered exactly what the problem with causal analysis is in some sense. Fairly obvious, but, but interesting, right? Which is causal analysis is, is a missing data problem, which is that I might observe, if you went to college, I know what your earnings are, but I'm missing data on what would happen to you if you hadn't gone to college. And so understanding now that we have a missing data problem creates a whole conceptual structure for thinking about how do we want to fill in the missing data. And under this general class of counterfactual models, many, many different methods have been developed. The most basic and in many ways the most obvious is what's called matching. So we find people who go to college and we try to find people who have the same characteristics and figure out whether they didn't go to college and compare them. And so that we might look at many, many variables, how well they did in high school, did they graduate from high school, who their parents were. Uh, perhaps we have tests of mental ability prior to going to college um, on both groups. And we would try to find pairs of people who were as similar as possible, one of whom had gone to college and one of whom hadn't, uh, in order to do uh, a, a comparison. There are other more sophisticated methods. We might want to say, look at a set of people who live in a city. Um, you know, here I am at Harvard in Boston. There are uh, many, many, many universities here in colleges, 67, 85, depending on how you count them. It's pretty easy to get to college here. <laughs> it's convenient to go to college. We might compare people in Boston where, in some sense, the cost of transaction moving, getting there, the college is low. Uh, the people, say, who uh, live in uh, rural Georgia, where there aren't many colleges, getting to college could be quite difficult. And so that would allow what's known as an instrumental variable technique. Uh, I don't think I want to go into the technical details about that. Uh, but we can make a comparison because presumably there are going to be people in Georgia that are comparable in important ways to those in Boston. But the big difference is that it was much more difficult for them to go to get to college. And as a result, they were less likely uh, to be in college. So we you know, now have this uh, well-defined notion of, of causality. Uh, what has happened within... Uh, the social and medical sciences, in, in part, are really two things. First, um, people have gone back and looked at traditional methods like regression analysis, uh, other, other approaches, and said, did these approaches actually give us true causal estimates? Do these methods work? And often the answer has been no. Then. In a parallel way, people have also gone and looked at various studies and asked, boy, did the results that people claim that they got uh, previously um, end up holding with using you know, better uh, causal analysis methods? So I give you uh, one, one example. Um, in the United States, uh, there's a lot of concern about whether the, the government should subsidize uh, private schools? Um, or should everybody have to go to public schools? And the argument always is, is, is that if we had a free market uh, and everybody went to, um, schools competed for students, uh, then we would have better schools. Now the question is, is how could we answer this question empirically? Well, the usual thing is to say, well, most private schools in the United States um, are Catholic schools. And so we should compare schools 
compare situations where students have gone to public school, what kinds of test scores do they get, how well much do they know at the end of, say, high school, to uh, Catholic schools and how well students do uh, when they go to, to uh, Catholic schools in terms of how much they end up knowing. Well, here, of course, we have the general selection problem again, which is uh, students who go to Catholic school, first of all, are more likely to be Catholic, surprisingly, though actually in uh, many inner cities uh, in the United States, many non-Catholic kids go to Catholic schools because the public schools aren't very good. It's also the case that Catholic schools have the right to kick kids out of school. Uh, so if somebody's not doing so well or somebody's a troublemaker, um, they can be thrown out where public schools do not have that option. So there's been some very careful uh, analysis done by a former student of mine, Steve Morgan at Cornell University, uh, comparing the effects. Uh, not a lot of evidence that Catholic schools do better, um, somewhat. But perhaps the most interesting finding uh, he had was that he discovered that the students who would benefit most from going to Catholic school were actually the students who were least likely to go to Catholic school. Of course, going to Catholic school costs money, and uh, the students who would benefit mostly would, would be students who came from families that didn't have the money to go to Catholic school. So the reason this is, is important um, is that if we were to decide to subsidize students to go to private schools, we would recognize, one, that the fact that we'd get a small effect in the data we've looked at is in part a function that it's the students who are least advantaged by going to private school that are going to private school. And so that it might be particularly important to provide significant su subsidies to poorer families because the benefit there would be greater since it's children from poorer families that seem to benefit the most to going at least to Catholic schools, but perhaps private schools more generally. The science of all this, the exciting thing that's going down now is these methods are being learned by graduate students in all kinds of departments. It's not just the high-tech uh, researchers that are using them. And so we're seeing them applied in many areas. I think probably the place it's going to have the biggest impact is in medical research. So it turns out that when you look at medical research, often you have problems that you can't do randomized experiments. And my colleague, Jamie Robbins, over at Harvard uh, School of Public Health, essentially ma has made a career of showing how every important study, suppose, you know, is, that's been done uh, gets the wrong answer because they've thought about causality the wrong way. So I think going forward, we're, you know, we're going to have a lot more clear thinking about causality and hopefully a, a much more solid and persuasive set of results. <laughs>